Right, as said, um, I'm first and foremost a, a geomythologist, uh, which means that when I was first sent this call for papers, I was delighted uh, because it describes my approach to pretty much everything archaeological. And I thought, great, I can talk all day. Marvellous. 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, but this was followed not all that long afterwards with a traitor thought, which whispered, but as long as it resonates meaningfully within context, does it really matter whether a tale is allegedly fact or fiction? And this is a traitor thought because as a geomythologist, my job is to tell one from the other. And I'm always twittering on about how geomyths are the historical novels of the past and how dialectical debate between fact and fiction crosses and divides disciplines from archaeology to philosophy. Questions of truth value via authenticity, authority and provenance abound alongside those of definition and theory and practice. Anyone who heard me speak yesterday will be well aware of this already the ethical considerations of handling the fictional narratives of other cultures is self-evidently as important as the responsibility we show towards the factual narratives. But the problem is, the alleged division between fact and fiction is something of a normatively constructed fantasy, one that we tell ourselves in order to make order of that which is chaotically human. For it could be said that fact and fiction are, in many ways, indiscernible from each other due to the vagaries of, of memory and cognitive dissonance so clearly expressed in the combination of science and myth for everything uttered is the telling of some type of story a myth because story is an event or sequence of events and narrative discourse is those events as represented so the type of narrative discourse representation storytelling can take to convey the uneasy marriage between fact and fiction is possibly limitless. But one of the oldest forms is poetry. Now, poetry is... Mm, well, actually, I'm afraid that I can't actually move the slide forward. I'm afraid that not only can I not work a computer, um, but I, I can no more define poetry than a terrier can define a rat. For the more I know about poetry, the more gun-shy I am to come up with statements regarding it. However, I can wax lyrical, but within my time constraints, about what poetry does, which is to allow us to see ourselves freshly and keenly. It makes the invisible world visible. It transforms our politics by enhancing our ability to make comparisons and draw distinctions. It reanimates nature for us connecting spirit and matter, it draws us more deeply into conversation with the traditions that we feed off, modify and extend. Which surely is what archaeology does too. Does archaeology not reveal that which is invisible? Does it not reanimate a space, an artefact that may have lain still and hidden for hundreds if not thousands of years? Does it not draw us ever more deeply into dialogue with the traditions within which we walk? Does it not reveal wonders? I would argue that it does, and thus it seems to me that therefore the two disciplines may be in sympathy with one another, but where they differ is in the manner of their narrative representation. Poetry is infamously emotive, often effuse and ethereal, it's personal, passionate and porous. Aristotle maintained that poetry expresses the universal, history the particular. This is because poetry takes us inside ourselves where we are all the same. It lets go of the need to hunt down particulars and respond holistically to truths that are felt rather than empirically quantified. It acknowledges a different set of truth values to that of science, having been liberated from the orthodox constraints of being empirically conditioned. Archaeology, on the other hand, sits on the opposite bank. I sit on both banks often getting very wet in the middle. Site reports, now they're the bread and butter of our discipline, but their aim is to convey data with maximum clarity. They're the opposite of poetry. They're dry, dispassionate and dehumanised. 
The authoritative voice is authorless. Their lines are unpeopled. What we read are the results of an experience. But we have no inkling as to the experience itself that led to those conclusions or to the breadth of the landscape about which they are concluding. Whereas a poem's power in his less to the conclusions than its propensity to resist them. Rather than asking to be justified, poems ask us to exist. Alison McCall at Stanford argues that being hang up on results rather than process causes the traditional site report and I would add the traditional paper and lecture also, which we don't have here today, misrepresents uh, the, the character and complexity of research and reasoning processes that generate the findings. It misrepresents because it decontextualizes, distorts the authenticity of representation by removing the presence of those who are making the assertions, replacing them with robotics. It's feeling phobic. As the cultural anthropologist Renato Rizaldo, funnily enough also of Stanford, says about academia in general, we tend to tell what it is we're about to tell, then we tell what it is, then we tell what it is we've just told. We don't show. But, but why? Why do we as researchers and scholars, whose work needs to have more community currency than ever before, remain wedded to telling rather than showing or imagining? Instead, why don't we do as the anthropologist and, and Madge suggest and seize back the creative initiative? For there are a plethora of different ways in which we can do this, and I'm not going to enter into those because with the, our, our current collection of people, that will become apparent as the afternoon progresses, and I'd be stood here for too long. What I will say is that more often than not, when we place value in creative archaeology, we tend to do so by looking only at its output, not at its process. Other than for its purpose for public engagement, Poetry is mostly something peripheral to our vision. It has no bearing upon our actual job. It's ornamentation. But from the poet's perspective, it's slightly different. As everything's relevant to our work, everything is potential inspiration. The landscape in which we wander, wondering most of all. We see this in the exceptional writing uh, of poets such as Heaney and Yeats to Christina Rossetti, Hardy and, and George Mackey Brown, where land and artefacts find immortality in a verse with an enduring clarity that allows us to still recognise them with poignant accuracy today. But their purpose is aesthetic, not functional. And today, indeed, the genre is still aesthetically popular. Even at the EA this year in Glasgow, uh, they had a little book in their care package, uh, sorry, conference bag, um, which contained a poem by none other than Kathleen Jamie. Now, the Archaeological Institute of America has a magazine, cunningly entitled Archaeology, which contains an online section given over to archaeo poets with the amazing subtitle, Shall I Compare Thee to a Backfilled Pile? Which takes romancing the stone to a whole new level. Now, research poetry, though, is still a lesser known field but one which nonetheless has a substantial following in those who are concerned not just with the why, but also the how of verse and voice. For just because a poem is published in an academic journal or spouted in conferences such as this one, it does not necessarily follow it would, that it would hold up to literary examination, but it should. Same could also be said for prose. For poetic inquiry can be the servant of contemporary literature and the archaeological record and critical theory. The uses to which it can be put are multifarious, such as you find with Eshin and Madge in the paper quoted that um, ostensibly they explored the use of poetry as a method for interpreting data collection and post-colonial geography research. They also utilised it as a source for analysis, for uncovering the previously unheard voices of participants and as art in its own right. Their data consisted of extensive interviews within rural communities and their poetic representations of these interviews then reflected the local tradition of oration. It was therefore not a result, but a method that contained a result. Now their work walks a particularly politically charged path between imperialist and aesthetically sentient approaches. But we don't need to be present in such a crevice in order to tunnel our way through the concept. 
Instead, what I'm suggesting is that we take it back a step. Let us consider how writing, reading or hearing a poem in response to the experience of working in the field can be of practical assistance in shaping our understanding and leading us to those austere conclusions that funding agendas will often require us to pen. As such, I'm suggesting a poetic equivalent to the prosaic practice of the fictive narrative, back to Alison McCall, who defines the fictive narrative up into three forms. Expressing a narrative voice, it's not the opinion of the writer, inviting free-form interpretation, and engaging the reader. It's the latter of these two to which poetry most lends itself. In releasing our way of thinking through having no limit to the language employed, through experimenting with alternative ways of writing, we stretch our manner of seeing and responding to the world. Renato Vizaldo described research poetry, or anthropoetics as he termed it, as being almost like practicing singing a lot and then having more notes a greater range in what you can do. It's therefore able to complement more conventional methodologies. The need is not necessarily to produce something that is written down, but to allow oneself to think poetically. For example, uh, last month I was working on a quaternary site in Essex, where the ground we were investigating took on the consistency of a wide platter of different confectionaries. It didn't matter who in the team came to our test pit. If you referred to a layer as being gingerbread or nougat, it was instantly identifiable. At one point, we even stood and held a serious discussion on whether or not we were dealing with ice cream. Once the flooding came into the trench, a discussion which included not only the archeologists, but also the digger driver and the landowner as equal contributors. Now that's posy, not science. But as a means of communicating the science, it was invaluable in a transient trench that was four metres deep and being collapsed by rain. This was because there can be an immediacy to poetic thought that allows us to show, to make present and focus in a, a culturally universal way, that the reader or listener can be taken into the heart of a topic from the offset, even with just a few lines. In this example, also from that quaternary side, both the verse and the photograph um, respond to the experience. Now, standing glued to the ground by clay in bleakest November, whilst an unforgiving sky emptied her buckets and a bulldozer tried not to become an artefact and planners stalked the telephone, this is not what most people would consider um, to, to be an inspirational environment. But being the first eyes to lay upon a paleo lake for probably 420,000 years, well, I think that's pretty wonderful. So I wrote a poem. And this is just one verse from it. From an unnamed continent, a forgotten lake responds with an iron jaw, revealing untold silences in the layering of clay. And reading these lines it transports me straight back to the experience, the shortcut to my memory. And this is how I use research poetry as a Polaroid in words. It's also particularly useful to sum up the essence of a long paper succinctly, with no need for prologue or appendices. I do this by applying a technique for prose poetry called cut out, where one takes a piece of somebody else's writing and one cuts out the extraneous words, leaving one's own interpretation behind in the words highlighted. Sometimes it's called found poetics. I find it helpful in representing the content of a piece from my own point of reference. By way of example, here's a paper on communicating geoscience. And this is before, this is after, and this is the result. Earth and communication. Every UK geologist knows that history has left its clues in the rocks underfoot. But such enlightenment is unlikely to be shared. For most members of the public are blissfully unaware of our geological portals into the past and hence are protected, as no one's told them in a way that makes them care. This is not meant to be a performative piece or a literary gem. It's simply note-taking. But the line, in a way that makes them care, is significant in a wider sense because by reinstating emotion, by caring, we create a route through which people can connect to a place, an artifact, a period, a person. This is the gift given by storytelling 
which poetry does just as well, if not better, than any other means. What it also does is to allow the thinking process a route of accessing what one is intuitively processing that has been unable to bring to the surface through conventional means. It replaces what the science removes. This is often a disquieting reaction to what some might call the ghosts of a place. It re-inhabits the bereft but working landscape. I shall turn to a colleague of mine, Dr Dermot Johnson, who's a philologist, who upon being asked for a field poem, sent me this. Digging in the Tavy. This river is a peopled river. There are faces in the water's eyes. All who ever looked linger there still reflected. A man crouches to drink, another fits arrow to bow, a rider seeks the ford, the fisher spins his coracle and peers. Two days I sat there, digging. How long until the waters call my name? In this poem, the poet has recaptured his sense of awe about the place in which he's digging, a sense of awe that can so easily become supplanted by our need to fulfil agendas against the onslaught of weather and time. It's also culturally aware, and as archaeologists, we not only have responsibility to the cultures we are examining, but also to the process we achieve this with one another and to ourselves. As Mark Pichenik so eloquently explores in Subjects and Narratives, the diktat of archaeological writing can be at odds with the demotic position we inhabit as living beings which can strip away the meaning we glean from the wonders we are uncovering. And in so doing, the whole reason we began archaeology in the first place. Thus, whilst I, I don't offer here a framework that you can cast into future research like a torch in the dusty corners of our betrayal experience, I do ask of you to consider that perhaps allowing ourselves a small narrative platform in which we gain and express how we feel when we hold a pot or discover a mosaic, make a leap of interpretation, so it's every bit as valuable as the rest of the words we create. Now, I'm not suggesting we all stand in trenches quilling sonnets, or that we are creative at the expense of our critical evaluations and conventional commitments, or that we can all be poets. I'm instead suggesting that we reattach and allow ourselves to connect with our research in a multi-sensory manner, to regain alternative perspectives upon what we do from inside our thinking before we succumb to the normative parameters of either fact or fiction. <coughs> For we are all storytellers with different specialist styles. We are all writing about wonders. Can we not therefore do so wonderfully? Thank you.